thought about this, ended up thinking about it because I was on a panel in 2008, so about a year and a half into being dean and a year past being IEEE president. Um, it was a tech leaders, women tech leaders conference, and I was on a panel. And the panel moderator asked each of the three or four panelists, it's like, okay, what are your core values? What drives you? What, what characterizes your leadership? Where does this all stem from? And I'm like, I don't know. I never thought about that before. And at the time, came up with five things which haven't changed except the number has grown over time with more, more thought, more experience, more experience with others. And, and this is, for me, the list. I'm also going to start by saying there's some things that are, could be on the list, but I get they're not there because, for me, they go without saying. So things like honesty, fairness, ethical behavior, um, valuing diversity and inclusion, these are core values but I don't actually talk about them because I think they're not optional. And so they're there, but the list gets too long. The ones here are, I, in my experience at this point, I would say not necessarily so universal. Um, so vision and strategy, and I've coded this very loosely to the vision relationships and execution, the VRE model. Um, I really, really like looking at the big picture, looking for connections. It's one of the reasons why I've led this, what sometimes feels like two parallel lives, Purdue and outside, because I need that outside to give me perspective on what's happening here and vice versa. Um, I believe in change. I, I believe that we can change, sometimes should change, that we can get better, we can also get worse, but that I think change actually is important. And so let's do this because we've always done it is, is a really, not interesting argument for me. I believe in balance. Um, and this shows up in, in my life in a lot of dimensions. In academia, I, I believe in a balance among land-grant missions of um, education, research, and engagement with community in the outside world. Um, I think they're all important. And try to balance them, which is hard. And it's not actually the way the university models are typically, even though the university talks about them. It's, it's, it's a hard balance to achieve. Um, I believe in balance between my inside activities, my outside activities. I believe in, I work, I believe in work like career balance. I have a husband and a daughter who just turned 30. And um, I have missed family events because of my job, but I have also missed job events because of my family. And I would like that to kind of balance out in most cases. I believe in excellence because I can get unbelievably excited about seeing a person, a group, or anyone doing something really exquisitely well. Whatever it is that is just excellence, doing something so mind-blowingly, astonishingly well. And ironically, because I value excellence, um, it also allows me to value people who have absolutely no interest in balance. Because all they want, they want to do this one thing, and I say, you know what, I'm okay with that. You do that, and some of the rest of us will try to be balanced, and it, I think it works out well. Um, I believe in humanity, which sometimes falls off the list under the goes without saying category, because I think it should, but sometimes I'm not so sure, and so at the moment it's on the list. Um, I do believe in community, both personal community, the, the people who support me, who are part of my very close network. I believe in local community, um, which is really when Epic started, where it was focused, but national and global community as well. I think these are important parts of who we are, and keeping track of them and keeping them in our thinking is valuable. I absolutely believe in communication, because a lot of failures fail because of failure to communicate, which is from a very old movie. Um, collaboration um, is something I just simply enjoy. And I, don't, I do think it expands all of our reach and our ability and lets us do things. But, but also, if, if people ask me over my whole career, what are the things I've enjoyed? Collaboration is very near the top of the list because I've worked with some amazing people. And I believe in education um, as a value in and of itself. I, I truly think that education is perhaps um, the best chance we have, the world has, 
for societal change, for social change, for fundamentally advancing, um, moving in new directions and doing things that benefit humanity in, in wonderful ways. And so that collection of things, I was, as I said, grounds me. Those are present. And if I find myself ignoring one of those, or worse yet, acting against one of those, for me, that's a wake-up call. Get back, get grounded, remember what you're doing. So just finally, I, I, for me, leadership is about people. This is a small snapshot that could get smaller. Um, it's about passion, because I think you've got to love what you're doing to make it. And, and I think it's about making a difference. Um, ultimately, why become a leader is because it is potentially a way to make a difference. And it's not just about having fun, but it is about making a difference. So that's it. So let's talk. I'll be happy to answer questions. Yeah, let me go back. Um, the five were, I had to make it, I had to look it up because I do. Um, big picture, change, balance, excellence, and community. And I think education was there, so I'm not quite, there's something in there that isn't quite right, but best I could reconstruct. Those, I can remember six, and I don't know which one wasn't there, because um, I'm pretty sure education was there. Yeah. Yeah. The strategy one ad got added because I've met more and more people who have no use for strategy. Um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it's just the way it is. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, like, as myself, I'm a pretty independent person, and so I've, like, always struggled, like, Sure. And so the question is, <laughs> focus person, you know, does a lot of work on his own. Talk more about collaborating because what, you know why is that valuable? What it, um, I think it depends on what you're working on because there are certainly some things where just zeroing in and focusing and saying I know this is a great individual endeavor. But I think there are a whole for me there have been a whole lot of things where I know this piece of this. But there's this whole this stuff around it that I know nothing about. And either I'm going to have to learn them all myself, or I'm going to have to, A, find people who do know something about them, and B, figure out how to talk with them, so how to create a common vocabulary, how to create shared goals and things like that. And um, I've, I have actually found this really enjoyable. It's, more, it's been more enjoyable in some settings than others. There's, I've been on some committees where it's like, could we please just not have this committee anymore because we are not collaborating. We're just fighting with each other all the time. And nobody's listening because this half of the room believes in change and this half of the room doesn't believe in change. And so there's a whole thing. But when collaborations are working well, when different people are bringing different perspectives but also different skills, different knowledge, if there's a shared, I think the key is a shared goal. That in that case, where everybody realizes like, wow, if we do this together, we can make this happen. Whereas you try to imagine how you do it on your own, um, much harder. And I, I've actually then found that collaboration itself becomes a real part of the success. It's like, oh my gosh, look at this incredible group that I got to work with and look what we got done. And, the College of Engineering Leadership team falls in that category. Um, so a lot of different perspectives. But also a big job because the college had, while well, I was dean, um, by, the time I, by, the, by the time I was done being dean, 450 faculty, over 450 staff, almost 12,000 students, and coming up on 90,000 alums. So this idea that you would do all that do anything by yourself. It, 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 there was no way. Yeah. <laughs> How was Epic's change? This is a really good question because, so I was away from day-to-day -day stuff with Epic's literally for 12 years. So 11 years as dean, 
I, I advised an EPICS team for my first semester as dean, and we all decided this is not a good idea. My schedule was not predictable enough. I was not reliable. I was just, it was like, no, not a good plan. The IEEE part may have been contributing to that, too. Um, and then I did a sabbatical first year. I came back in the fall, and I'm, I'm co-advising two teams. One of my requests was, could I co-advise a team with somebody, please? Um, because philosophically, it hasn't changed. So big picture goals, philosophically, what are we trying to do? Why are we trying? Day-to-day -day stuff, completely different. It's like, what do you mean the design notebook is on the SharePoint server? And oh, by the way, which SharePoint server? I'm sorry, I couldn't resist that. <laughs> That's OK. No, and, and, but those are things I can learn. Those are, those are me. You know, it's, it's grown, obviously. The, the reach of the projects has grown. So the, initially, the focus was largely on local community partnerships, which, which was interesting when I would talk with colleagues from universities in cities like New York or Philadelphia or, you know, or, or, or Los Angeles. And it's like, what local community problems? You live in a college town in the Midwest. And it's like, no. That part hasn't changed. There, there are local community needs, but the, 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 the distance, I mean, one of the teams I'm working, well, both of the teams I'm working with have multiple community partners, and in each case, one of them is local, but in one case, one of them is in Fort Wayne and the other one is in Jamaica. So the, the distances and how do you manage that and, and why do we do that, which I think was an absolutely natural um, progression of not only has engineering education style changed in 20, 25 years, but the importance of being global has changed. It wasn't a big deal. And now it's hard to be relevant if you're not global. And so I think that that's been a really important and necessary change for ethics. Um, and then some things that really do just have to do with the growth, that there's some things where efficiency has become critical because it's large. It's really large, and so the need for efficiency. I would say the other thing is the, um, the role of first-year students has changed a lot. Um, when we first started, I will say there were no first-year students because the three faculty were all in electrical and computer engineering. And then, as now, ECE faculty didn't teach first-year students, so we knew nothing about first-year students. We like, we don't know what they do. We don't know what they can do. Just like, we're not going to mess with that. And then it actually just through collaboration and interaction with a couple faculty members, in, and, and Bill Oakes is one of them, um, said, no, there's actually a lot of value in this. Um, I think it's grown faster than anyone expected. And so that's something that I think is, is, um, is a good thing, but it also changes the nature of the teams. And, and so I think there's just continued growth that's happening. And I will say also, not only at Purdue, but Epics in scope has certainly grown with over 50 universities. The high school program didn't exist. And so it's, yeah. What made you choose to come to Purdue as a faculty? Okay, why did I come to Purdue as a faculty member? So I was finishing my PhD in um, electrical engineering and computer science at Princeton. I honestly didn't know if I wanted to go into academia or to industry, so I interviewed in both. I spent my last semester there frantically trying to you know, wrap up research and get it to the point where I could write things up, but also interviewing, which was great, because I had the opportunity to interview places. And Purdue had some faculty who, nobody working directly in the same area that I was, but people working in touching areas, so there were Unusual in that point in time in an electrical engineering department, there were, there were very, very respected faculty working in artificial intelligence, which was not common at all. But there were some people working in signal processing. There was a faculty member working in music processing, which has a lot in some common with speech. But also, um, the, 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 the school, the head of the school, uh, was looking to basically grow, build, a, a, grow a computer engineering program. So literally hired six of us in one year to build a computer engineering program. And those things all together, I had lived outside Chicago for a while, so even though I'd grown up in New Jersey, it wasn't totally alien 
to be in Indiana. Um, I had driven through it, but you know, <laughs> I counted for something. Um, but there were, it, it was the job. It really, it really was the job and the people and the opportunity. The, 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 the starting a computer engineering program was pretty exciting. And um, so, so I came here and I stayed. I am the only one of the six who is still here. Um, I don't know what that means, but yes, <laughs> it was a good opportunity. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Was it ever intimidating to go into leadership roles? Like, like yes. Like always. <laughs> always. Always. In, yes. Was it ever intimidating to go into a leadership role? Yeah, because I really, I mean, I had no formal preparation for this. I, I, the other thing I would say, um, I actually inherently am really shy. I, I mean, I have learned over a long time that, okay, talking to people, that's great. That's fun. I can do that. But it was never something that was just it's like, for sure, I'm going to get to meet lots of people. What a great idea. Um, so there was, yeah, a lot of uncertainty. Um, it wasn't, I don't think any of us knew what name to put on it at that time, but a lot of imposter syndrome. Certainly, I never knew enough about it to know what it was. Now I do. Um, it's still there every once in a while, less than it used to be. Um, but I, the things that help, uh, the, the, the champions, the, the other cheerleaders, the people in IEEE, people at Purdue who just had confidence and said, you know, you can do this. Why don't you do this? It's like, really? It's like, okay, and that's good. Um, but there's still been moments, and two in particular. So 11 years as dean, so there's, a, there's the Big Ten, obviously. Um, which now has 14 schools. And, but the, the, there was a group, informal group called the Big Ten Plus, which were the deans of engineering of the Big Ten schools, which at that time didn't include IU, so you know, however many there were. And then the, 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 the top engineering schools, so MIT, Stanford, Berkeley, Carnegie Mellon, Texas, Austin, Cornell, and Georgia Tech. So there were about 20 of us. And we would meet once a year we get together in Chicago, always in Chicago, get together for dinner, and then spend an entire day talking about what was happening at our place and challenges, solutions. We would share what things were, you know, we, it, it became an amazing network. And then we would use email the rest of the year to say, okay, we're tr we, we have some people who are trying to do this. How do you do that at your institution? So for the first eight of those 11 years, I was the only woman in the room. I felt like I was back as an undergraduate again. And it was a little disconcerting. Um, last couple of years, Stanford and UT Austin appointed women deans of engineering. None of the Big Ten schools, but you know, got there. The other time was actually I, I was on the board, and I chaired the board actually for, for several years of the Anita Borg Institute for Women in Technology. So Grace Hopper Conference, um, they, are the, they are the founders and sponsors of the Grace Hopper Conference. They work with high tech companies. The leadership, women in leadership tech forum that challenged me on my core values was an Anita Borg thing. And, and I, I was on the board and chaired the board. And one of the things that they have done just superbly well um, was connect with companies in tech. And there's, 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 a, there's, there's some ambiguity here because, I mean, they're, they're sponsors. They're, they're serious sponsors for everything they do, include Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, Thomson Reuters, I, just this sort of who's who of high-tech industry. And at the same time, you look at a lot of those companies and say, well, you're not looking so good. In this IBM, actually, IBM looks better than most of the rest. But you know, you're you're not really looking so good in this realm of how are women doing in your industry? What are the numbers, and how are the women treated in your industry? And which maybe is why they've been such big supporters because they're looking for somebody to help them. And and the Anita Borg Institute has done a thing about it's a scorecard, and they work with companies 
to say, here are measures of diversity that you can collect data in your company. And we will work with you as consultants to help you find weak points and rooms for improvement. So I was on the board. So all those companies, um, their board representatives typically were their vice president for research, their vice president for operations, their chief financial officer, their chief HR officer. And at that time, by that time, I did know about imposter syndrome. And I'm sitting there going, what am I doing in this room? But they're incredible people. And you know, I'm lucky to know them and continue to know them. So yeah, there, there are times, um, more than anything else, having people believe in me made the difference. Every, my family, but also colleagues. And, and that, that's really been the single most important thing. There were people who believed in me and said, of course you can do this. OK, take a deep breath. I think it's late. So, thank you, and good luck.